why don't we begin this presentation and the I'll keep my eye out for anyone else who joins us, but we'll start our presentation and let me just give you um, some um, guidelines. Uh, my name is Tanis and I'm the artistic director of Farm Arts Collective. And I wanna welcome everybody to this winterization of homes workshop with Michael Chernicki and with Stephen Stewart. And um, if you're able, any kind of donation for this workshop would be greatly appreciated. And you can always donate on the website, on our Farm Arts website. So enjoy the workshop and let's hand it over to our esteemed workshop leaders, Michael and Stephen. Thank you, Dennis. From the beginning, well, Tannis already introduced herself and about the Farm Arts Collective, and she mentioned something about our uh, the Farm Arts Collective event um, tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock, which will be a wonderful. We're getting going to have looks like the weather's going to um, in our right direction. So that, that's as a side note. Um, so the two presenters are Stephen. Stephen, do you want to just um, introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Stephen Stewart. I live in Narrowsburg, New York. Um, been a lifelong student of um, sustainability. I remember growing up as a kid in Dayton, Ohio, about 300 miles south of where Michael grew up, um, you know, hanging those clothes out with that solar and wind uh, powered clothing dryer. Um, my uh, parents built or bought a new home in 1954. And the, one of the first things that my father did was to remove this gorgeous um, cedar shake siding, but he had um, cellulose insulation pumped into wow. the house because they, the houses back then, they didn't really have insulation in them. Uh, so, um, and I remember it's just as a rule, you know, whenever we left a room, we had to turn the lights out. And then I remember the utility company sending out little stickers when not in use, turn off the juice. So um, little habits like that have become ingrained in me. I've been um, lately following just the entire development of how we retrofit, build new and retrofit buildings to bring them to a more carbon uh, sequestering uh, status so that we're actually driving down our greenhouse gas emissions as we build and as we remodel. Yeah, he, he also works for the Sullivan County for the Office of Sustainability and um, and helps out with the county uh, new, on the New York side, the, the county's efforts of um, making things more sustainable and everything for the for the uh, county and the inhabitants. And so I'm Michael Chinick, I have an architectural firm and I've, I've uh, been working here since um, 87, 1987 and have really got involved with um, you know, sustainability through a lot of it through Apple Pond Farm, Dick Risling, who some of you uh, may know and, um, and the Sullivan Alliance for Sustainable Development. And so, been doing that and, and trying to incorporate all the sustainable principles into uh, my architectural projects as much as I can. Um, so some opening thoughts, um, you know, we talked about this being a winter rising, but winter rising by itself is, is wonderful, but it's only a part of the whole picture of the, um, uh, you know, uh, of what needs to be done in order to try to reduce our, our, our greenhouse gases uh, emissions. It's amazing what, what's happening and to be in denial of that is just, uh, is just outrageous. Uh, uh, actually, we've been watching, I've been watching the planet Earth and it just talks about how, you know, the heating of the oceans and the, um, the acidification of the oceans and everything and this uh, weather is, is happening where where fish and and are you know ninety percent have been gone and you know and just what we're doing is amazing and a lot of it's tied to our actions this uh, 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 weather um, greenhouse gas effect and and this uh, climate heating up so. So weatherization is, is integrally tied with sustainability, the sustainability of the earth and the inhabitants on it. 
um, and we've already talked about, we'll be monitoring the chat box uh, during the presentation. So if you have any comments, please type them in and we'll get to them as soon as we can uh, as they come in. So um, yeah, it's uh, winterizing is about improving the home energy's efficiency. That's what it's really about. And so which when you do that, you improve your occupant comfort, the health and safety of the home and save money. And so many other benefits come from from weatherizing and, and winterizing. So um, uh, Stephen and I have taken, you know, the the whole the house as a whole integrated system. It's not isolated aspects um, of it, but it's the entire house itself. And when you change something in one area of the house, um, such as tighten it up, if you start to you know, really air seal it well and get it air sealed so well, then you have to think about, you don't wanna be uh, trapping indoor um, pollutants and things like that. So you have to think about ventilation. So you get it so tight, but you have to let it breathe also. Um, Stephen, you have any thoughts on any of this or should I just keep Yes, going? yes, Michael. Um, your reference to the indoor air pollutants is really key to keeping our homes healthy for the occupants and safe as well. And where we get a lot of those indoor air pollutants are from how we, well, what we furnish our houses with what we paint our rooms with, what we cover our floors with. And as, as we're moving more and more into sustainability and, and how we create healthy, safe spaces to live and work in, uh, we're really doing deep dives into materials and healthy materials. And um, just one, so a lot of the materials that we have in our houses now are petrochemicals. The fabrics that cover a lot of our furnishings are nylon um, or uh, a, a synthetic blend. Uh, floor coverings, uh, nylon and olefin carpeting um, you know, are some of the most popular fibers that are on the market now. Uh, wall covering, vinyl wall coverings. And, and just, these are just Pardon? paint also uh, yeah these embodied BOCs the the volatile organic compounds that are carcinogenic right and so all of these um, compounds continue to emit gas so they off gas throughout their life in our homes and as we seal our buildings to prevent heat loss uh, unless we ventilate well and, and that might sound like a contradiction. We're gonna seal our building to prevent heat loss, but then we have to ventilate well. There's a really fine balance. And oftentimes we hear, well, you can't make your building too tight because buildings have to breathe. Well, yes, they do. And that's where we'll talk about controlled ventilation a little bit later on. But the other thing with the materials, and, and this is really, um, really kind of, crucial and critical. I'm a volunteer firefighter and what we're learning and what we've seen is that the legacy fire of 40 years ago, it, it, if, if there was a fire in your house that, that resulted from someone putting their cigarette in the trash can or, or, or it, the ash fell onto a sofa or a chair, it would take about 40 minutes for that fire to really reach the stage that we call flashover, where everything is so superheated in the building that everything gets consumed by the fire. Today's legacy, today's fire, from the time that your smoke detector is activated, you have less than two minutes to get yourself out of your house. And that's because these, these materials are also very highly flammable and they combust just instantaneously. Um, so it's both a fire and a, a health issue. So we, can, we need to 
to take a look at, at how we change up the fabrics that we have. We need to go back to natural fibers, cotton, wool. Uh, They're also toxic. The materials we use today are toxic. So if the fire doesn't get you the, you know, the, the smoke and, and the off product of yes. the fire is very, very detrimental. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, but that was my digression on that topic, Michael. Sorry. No, that's okay. That's, it, it all ties in, everything ties in with this, um, with winterization and weatherization and how you right. you do that. So um, they're kind of synonymous. We already talked about that, um, reducing the global warming and, and aiding. It's all about sustainability. That's what it boils down to. And um, besides uh, physical changes, just as important as occupant behavior, you, you, how we use the house and how we use all the equipment. It's amazing. On, I have a list of like all the types of things we have in our house. It's amazing what we have. And, and each one has its own, you know, its own energy draw and how you use those, those products is, is so critical. Um, so, the concept, well, these are basic concepts of sustainability to reduce, you know, consume less energy, um, you know, might involve lifestyle changes, but it's, it's really one of the purest ways you can reduce energy. And then obviously recycle, everyone probably um, goes recycling and stuff, but that has, has its own embodied energy cost because you think about it, you take your car to the recycling or the transfer station, then it's hauled to someplace else to a central location, then it's hauled back to someplace and be processed and, and remade into something else. And it, so that even recycling is wonderful thing to do, but there's a lot of energy that's required for that. So if you reduce the amount that you have to recycle, you're you're saving in a big way. And reuse, uh, uh, you know, trying to be creative, implementing materials uh, that are headed to the, the landfill um, is, is important. And actually the, the biggest thing is refrain, try not to get caught up with this, uh, the materialism and everything and, 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 and buy things, buy things in bulk so you have less containers and um, you know, and refrain from th this uh, uh, spontaneous uh, uh, purchasing. Um, so economically speaking, reducing refrain has a, a hundred percent payback. Um, you know, because you it costs nothing to do that, but you're saving money by not investing in that. Um, so a just, just, a, just a quick little note, Michael. Please. Uh, yeah, we talk about the cost of recycling, and it has a cost. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that um, uh, this is a, a little tip from Craig Jones, who's developed an entire uh, inventory of carbon, um, embodied carbon in building materials. He says that reducing a single, now this is from England, a single 500 milliliter aluminum can, recycling it, saves enough energy to power a television for over four hours. Hmm. Um, so the, yeah, recycling does take a lot of energy to do the recycling, but it takes less energy and is less harmful to the environment than mining the new materials to, uh, to make yeah. that new aluminum can. No, it's, okay, that's a, a good point. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so uh, just a definition of real quick uh, of what we feel like uh, this, uh, the um, sustainability, sustainable buildings, one that can be produced or rehabilitated and be operated over long term to support human activities while maintaining a resilient and healthy structure with minimally adversity to the natural environment. So a pretty no brainer, but that's, um, you know, that's what we're, we're aiming for. So some tools to use in a sustainable is um, minimize the use of non-renewable uh, energy and materials and uh, using your sun and, and using like um, we were just talking about earlier before the presentation, hang drying and stuff. So that's, a, that's a re definitely renewable energy and 
materials too. Um, we'll get more into materials, but there's so, the embodied energy of materials is important to consider because some materials, you say, yeah, they do a good job, but there's so much energy that goes into those materials in order to produce them that you're you're way you're not offsetting that energy that goes into them. Michael, if I could just interject here for a moment. Mm -hmm. Considering the you know, minimizing the use of non-renewable materials, you might say, well, what's a non-renewable material? I don't get it. So consider the most popular, one of the most popular and most widely sold and uh, grossly overstated building cladding materials, vinyl siding. Vinyl siding is, first of all, it's not made from a renewable it's not a renewable material. Um, and the fact that it is vinyl, it's polyvinyl chloride, means it's another one of those products that off-gasses a chemical that affects our health. Uh, polyvinyl chloride off-gasses uh, a chemical that, that disrupts our endocrine system. And when you start adding in again, that vinyl material with your indoor air quality, you're, you're sacrificing your health for what seems to be a cheaper material, um, but the health costs are tremendous. So a, a renewable material for cladding a house is wood siding or um, plaster. If you have a, a straw bale house, a, a plaster coating is, uh, well, also you can use um, one closer to renewable and some of the companies actually use a lot of renewable products is fiber cement board. Because a lot of people use vinyl siding because of the maintenance. They say, well, we don't wanna to have to be painting and, and stuff like that. But, but um, a fiber cement board, Hardy board, you may have heard it as a brand name, but it's, you got the market um, and that, that uses um, a, a many times, a, a, I don't know, 50 to 60% of renewable material. So it's not 100%, but it's um, a much closer, and the longevity of it's much longer. If you vinyl side, if you see a house with vinyl side that's 10, you know, like 20 years old, that starts breaking down and starts fading and everything. and and it's just not a, a very strong, where something made out of fiber cement board, which is um, concrete-like, you don't have to paint it every, you know, 10 years or five years, like a, a, um, a, a wood, and it lasts for a long time. So, okay, we talked about under, um, building life cycle and longevity into your homes. Well, using materials that'll last for a long time. It may, might cost a little bit more, but in the long run, they will, um, you'll save the money because of the longevity of it and less maintenance of, of those kind of um, materials. And another sustainable tool is obviously building science principles, incorporating those, which we'll get into a little, a little bit later, um, the building science principles. So they're all, yeah, um, some more, for, this is um, just what we've talked about, you know, in reducing one's carbon footprint and some materials are better than others. And you can find that, you know, the embodied costs of material, embodied energy of materials. Um, you know, all of these, we talked about that, you know, the, the processing and shipping, uh, uh, even recycle, um, recycling has some energy, but that's a good point that Stephen uh, brought up. That I guess studies have said that it definitely is better than um, extracting materials from the environment and less harmful to the environment too, because you're not disturbing, you know, some mountaintop or some hillside. So a little uh, tidbit to keep in mind, if you could go back to that other slide, Michael. So as we're you know, progressing more and more into the realization that we must draw down greenhouse gas emissions that we emit into the atmosphere if we're to meet our 
goal of um, keeping a, a steady temperature by 2050, um, we're talking about embodied energy. And, and embodied energy is what Michael just talked about. It's the greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted when we mine new materials, when we transport new materials to a factory to be made into concrete or steel or foam plastic or anything else. Um, so the embodied carbon is all of the energy and the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that from extraction to the delivery to the job site. And that's becoming more and more of a concern. Um, we know how to make buildings energy efficient. We know how we have equipment that will uh, help us have a net zero energy operations building. But if we continue to front load the atmosphere with the greenhouse gases from the building materials that uh, require heavy amounts of energy to mine and process and ship, we probably won't make our 2050 mark. Mm -hmm. Okay, so weatherization, why it's important. Um, even if every new, new structure was built as a net zero, you may have heard of net zero homes that they don't use any more energy than, than, than they produce. Uh, on site, we'd still fall way short. So the the housing stock in the U.S. is, is you know uh, tens of millions of houses. So it's important that we we take care of our our houses and and address them. Um, you know to to uh, have the longevity of the planet and its, its inhabitants. Um, retrofit, retrofitting and energy efficient homes require careful planning details. Uh, the whole we talked about the whole house um, systems approach, and you know by looking at all the aspects of the home, not just one aspect of it, um, is important because changes in one component of the house can greatly affect components of other ones, um, other aspects of the house. So the three major items that I feel and I, um, are important to look at, the, these are the base, there's many of them, but the air sealing, we mentioned about that, trying to seal our house so we don't have leaky homes and there's not air, you know, many air changes uh, per hour in the house. Uh, standard house built, you know, maybe like 10 years ago without any, they might have, um, you know, eight to 10 air changes per hour. That, every hour, uh, you know, that means you're heating and you're sending out all that heat or all that cooling out of the house 10 times a, a um, hour. And the new codes now are talking about, in New York State, it's three ch air changes per hour. Because you do need some air change per hour, but it's it's best to do it in a controlled way than in an ad hoc way. So if you have air sealing and insulation, the amount of insulation, if you can add insulation, like in your attic space, in your accessible spaces, in existing houses, um, that helps out tremendously. And you look at thermal bridging also, which is is the conductivity of um, of of heat or, or, or coolness going through a product. Um, an example of this is you put insulation in your wall, but you have all your studs, your bottom plates, your top plates, all the wood, which has a um, minimal amount of insulation. Um, so the overall effect of the wall is um, not what the R value or the resistive value of the insulation you put into the wall, but you have to also factor in the thermal bridging of materials. Um, that's why putting a, a, being able to install a total uh, um, a rigid insulation or some insulation on the exterior that is a thermal break to this thermal bridging is very, very helpful as far as the energy savings. And that's where the energy code is going to as well. And a lot of the new 
uh, carbon sequestering wood-based insulations are, are uh, driving to it. Once you can, you can insulate your building from the exterior and properly done uh, with the proper air barrier and the proper water resistive barrier and the proper rain screen, you can make a very durable building. You can eliminate that thermal bridging. And um, uh, I don't know, later on somewhere in the slide, yeah, we, we we have a, do we have that roof picture? The roof? Um, you know what? That I saw got, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, that one got yanked out. Okay. Uh, so if you ever want to, if you want to, if you want to just do a, a, an interesting experiment in your home this winter, um, if you have a, um, a, a an infrared thermometer, you might have gotten one, picked one up to do your temperature check every day for COVID-19. Um, but an infrared thermometer instantly reads the temperature on the surface of a, uh, on, the, on the surface. So if you go to your outside walls and uh, take a temperature reading where you know there's a, a stud or a wall framing member, which will be typically very close to your window, then move about eight inches away from that and take another reading. You will typically see, unless your house is already um, exteriorly insulated, you'll see a temperature difference. Where that stud is, it's going to be colder than the center portion of the wall. Significantly colder yeah. um, than where the insulation is. So, so some of the things of uh, reduced utility and maintenance costs that a weatherization does increases comfort, reduces noise, and a healthier, safer environment are all the items that we're looking for. Um, Stephen, you gave me this slot um, about conduction, conduction, yes, radiation. I can talk about those. So in uh, weatherizing a house and really taking charge of how comfortable your house is, there are, uh, it's really good to understand how heat and moisture move through a house. And three principal ways are conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is very simply, you have a warm surface, you touch that surface, and that heat immediately conducts to your body. Your walls are the same way. If, if your wall is cold because it's poorly insulated, the warm air that's in the house is gonna to move toward that wall and it's gonna move right through the wall. That's conduction. Um, Conduction, another way, you know, if you have a hot pan and you pick up the handle and that handle is heated from cooking, that's, that's conducting the heat to your hand. Convection is um, how air flows as a gas using the, the um, principles of warm air we know rises. So you can get, um, air circulating around a room in a convective loop that actually loses energy because that warm air is rising, it hits the ceiling, it ceiling is warm, but, but the junction of your ceiling and your wall is cold. So that heat's gonna loop around to the outside wall. It's going to lose more energy through the outside wall so that air becomes cooler. It's gonna to drop to the floor, which is even cooler, so it loses more energy. So that convection um, is a big way, a major way that we can lose heat if we don't have um, our house, our, our insulation and, and our um, air sealing mm -hmm. balanced in the house. Air sealing and insulation is a way to reduce that stratification of temperatures on walls and floors. And if you reduce the stratification, you're reducing the convection flow, the convective flow. And the third way that heat moves is by radiation. And you have probably all experienced sitting or standing by a window and you, know, you're, you might be in front of a wood burning stove or you might, you know, in front of a heat source. 
So the front of your body feels really warm and cozy, but your back, which is facing the window, feels really chilly. That's because your body heat is now radiating to that window that um, is allowing that, it's, it's pulling that heat from your body and, and pulling it outside. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite example of radiation, what I feel it is, I walk my dog every morning. The first uh, quarter of a mile, I'm in a tree shaded road and I reach a certain point and I'm in an open field and the sun is just there. There's no trees to block it. And the radiation from the sun just warms me immediately. So that's, mm -hmm. those are the three ways uh, that heat moves through a house. And this next slide, we talked about insulation and air seeing. We already talked about um, if uh, uh, indoor pollutants and you're trapping those in the house when you're air sealing. Um, you don't you want to be able to address those indoor pollutants and and not create a, a more hazardous situation and um and and so you need to to address those such as mold and radon and unnecessary moisture points of, of contact of moisture in the home um uh, Space heating and cooling. Now this starts getting into um, how much uh, energy for space heating and cooling. We we the energy use of a house typically is around fifty percent, um, and it's the largest cost. So if you can do anything to help reduce your costs and and, and help reduce the amount of energy you use, it's keeping up your your heating and cooling systems. And if you're in the market to replace anything in your house, then looking for such systems that are very environmentally um, friendly and uses less energy, such as a, an air source heat pump, which we'll get into a, a little bit later. Um, so, um, so yeah, we just uh, talked about upgrading grading them when selecting um, you, you want to, to um, look at the different type of systems that you can use and they, they tend to start paying back for themselves too if you replace uh, a, a you know, really funky old uh, uh, furnace and you put in air source heat pumps instead. Yes, there's an initial cost, but if you're going to be needing to replace the furnace and everything and um, you you start to pay back that price difference between the new system and the existing system. One of the advantages too of, of um, weatherizing your house, upgrading the insulation and air sealing is um, it's going to reduce your energy load so that when you do need to replace that um, um, furnace or you do need to replace your hot water heater or you do need to replace your air conditioning system, you can usually, in fact, you can always um, replace what you have with a smaller system so that um, your cost for that system, the initial dollars and cents that you put out for that system will also be reduced. And it's an important thing to keep in mind if you do any kind of weatherization and then you upgrade, make sure that uh, your contractor that's going to do that upgrade of your mechanical systems understands that your house has been improved, your thermal envelope has been improved. Don't let them just replace like kind for like mm -hmm. quality. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the whole idea that the whole house is that your insulation, your air seating affects other parts of the house. That's your heating and cooling equipment. Um, you know, so if you you do that, and also especially if you're looking for doing uh, um, putting on solar, if you solar electric or something, if you reduce the amount of um, use you you want the first thing you do before you put on any solar electric is try to make your house as efficient and as possible so you can put on a smaller system than what you would need um 
you know, if you just left your house as is. And there's payback, uh, you know, there's a, there's a good payback time for that. Um, and you also have to think about your thermostats and ducts and things like that. You know, you don't want to just replace a furnace. And if your, your ducts are in unheated spaces and they don't have any insulation on them, well, you're, if, you, if you insulate those first, you can actually put in a smaller system, uh, like Stephen was saying, um, you know, any ducts that are in unheated spaces. Uh, you so Michael. Yeah. Um, we're going to be talking about air source heat pumps soon, and, and Tannis um, has an air source heat pump. Uh, can we get her to, can, can um, she take the screen for a bit to show us that heat pump? Just so, that, I don't know if everybody knows what an air source heat pump looks like, or, uh, you know, because you've got indoor and outdoor components. Mini split? Yeah. I have. I have mini split. We put mini splits in a couple of years ago in the house we're living in. And I, if people are interested, I can show them, just show you what they look like. Yeah, well, here, I'll just um, real quick. Oh, right? there's Michael's. Huh. Uh, there's there's one, one up there, which actually I'm gonna have to move because it got installed too close to the ceiling, but, the, but that's what the units look like um, up in the corner there. Um, and on with with heat pumps, there's some really wonderful new technology coming out. Um, if if your home is heated with hot water baseboard heat, uh, there is a heat pump system that will link right into your uh, hydronic system, so you can eliminate the use of oil or um, gas. To, to fire that boiler. Um, there are some uh, through the wall um, systems coming out where you don't have to have the compressor outside. It's all contained in one unit. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of amazing technology yeah. systems, uh, in, the, in the pipeline. Yeah, we'll talk more about heat pumps, but they're very efficient also, you know, extremely. Yeah, they're electric, but um, they they produce three three hundred percent the amount of electric you put into the heat pump you might get you know three uh, you know three times that amount of energy or heat out of it it's not a one to one like an elect they're totally different than electric baseboard heats where that's just a a, a direct one to one what you put in is what you get out in heat here you get three four times as much heat out for what the electric you put into it. So um, water heaters are you know, another one. I mean, if you have an old, very old water heater, that may be using much more e uh, electric, if it's an electric water heater, um, much more. So it, it kind of, um, it uses the, the electric water heaters use quite a bit um, in there. And also not just with water heaters, but with everything, you should always look at the Energy Star. Um, they give you a rating and, and their products, the Energy Star rated are, if you're replacing any kind of equipment is very important. Two of the newest um, appliances that use heat pump technology uh, are hot water heaters and clothes dryers. So an electric clothes dryer uh, takes a lot of energy to dry those clothes. The, there are now heat pump clothes dryers that actually dehumidify the clothes. You don't have to have that exhaust vent going to the outside, which is another way that we can lose heat energy. Uh, the, mm -hmm. As the clothes dry, the water comes off the clothes, it's collected in a condensate pan and it's pumped down the same drain that your washing machine drains down to. And the air source heat pump, uh, hot water heaters will have that same high efficiency um, of use of electricity to produce hot water. So you'll, if you're replacing your electric hot water heater, you will see a nice savings on your electric bill. And if you are replacing 
your gas hot water heater, replace it's a good idea to replace it with a heat pump hot water heater because that gas is another source of indoor air pollutants. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, the, we're, now we're going to go through some more um, specific things very, very quickly. We'll go through this because everyone's going to get this uh, PowerPoint um, mail to uh, email to them along with the presentation uh, next week sometime. So um, yeah, turning down your water heater thermostat. Oftentimes they're preset at a very high temperature, and 120 is what they, you know they recommend. You know it would be a a good temperature to set your water heater. So. So, um, and then using your cooling and heating wisely, um, that's a, a no brainer. Uh, keep your refrigerator cool, uh, but not too cool. They say uh, between, um, it's good, between 30 and 35 um, degrees or 35 and 40 is what, what it should be at to be optimum um, to, to be efficient. Air dry your dishes instead of using the pre-dry, the pre-heat drying um, saves a bunch of energy. Anything that, that cause that's a resistive um, uh, electric heat that, that uses a lot of energy. Uh, wash, wash as much as you can, wash clothes with cold water instead of hot water. Um, uh, hang your clothes out to dry. Tannis was just speaking, she's doing her laundry and she's got her clothesline and will be Hanging them out there. Use as Stephen said, as the solar a solar dryer, um, solar and wind dryer. Uh, turn off lights. Uh, avoid phantom loads. Um, a lot of people don't realize that all your electronic equipment uses energy even when they're not on, such as TVs and stuff. You know, because everything's remote control, so it's always. It's always on in kind of like a, a more sleep mode, but if you have power strips and stuff, and so, so you cut off the electric to it, it's waiting for that uh, remote control to say, go on, you know, okay, let's see you. So they, there's a lot of phantom loads of all your electronics um, that are being used. Um, wash clothes, uh, uh, clean. Okay, clean, clean or replace filters. Yeah, keeping your, your furnaces and your equipment and doing the filters, oftentimes we just totally forget about it. And, um, and so we should really look at that, your furnace or, or whatever kind of filter you might be using, because when they start getting clogged, it, it brings down the efficiency of that equipment uh, quite a bit. Um, Defrost your refrigerator. Well, most of them are, are auto defrost. Um, uh, during warm months, close the blinds and shades uh, on the sun side of it. Um, uh, so, because that it's amazing on how much that reflects the heat out of the sun when you close those uh, drapes or blinds. Uh, this one was dope peak in the oven. Uh, uh, it dry every time you take a look in the oven, it drops. It can drop like around 25 degrees, and then when you close the oven, it's got to heat back up. Um, so that's these are all small little um, uh, control your fixtures. It would be um, you know putting dimmers and also motion sensors or timers that will turn things off, especially exterior lights. You know. Motion detectors are great because if there's no one out there, why should that exterior floodlight um, be be on? So, um, and don't leave all your electronics on 24/7. Turn them off when you know you're going out for a long period of time. Um, using a ceiling fan can um, can uh, is a good. Good thing. I forget what they said. It 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 kind of um, you can be it raises um, uh, the thermostat four degree will allow you to raise the thermostat if you're cooling to four degrees Fahrenheit with no reduction in comfort um, with that little bit of interior air movement. 
keep refrigerators full. It's hot solid, solids um, create a lot less or, or need a lot less energy to stay solid. So we even put the water bottles in our freezer and stuff when it's not when it's not filled or the ice packs and things because it's much more efficient for refrigerators to keep solids to freeze and keep solids and to keep air cool to that degree. So, uh, you know, especially in this COVID time, keeping your refrigerators and freezers full make a whole lot of sense because they also save you energy um, that way. Um, and then, and then dishwashers, you know, uh, uh, dress for the weather, watch, uh, uh, watch your appliance uh, placement um, is, is, you know, where you put things, because if you put a, some kind of appliance near your thermostat, you may be affecting that uh, thermostat. Um, like, let's say it's on cooling mode and you have the air blowing out of one of your, your appliances near that thermostat, it, it's giving a false reading uh, for that. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's good to, um, to think about that, where your thermostat is and where you put um, appliances. And set your thermostat, they, they recommend 78 in summer and 68 in winter, uh, you know, as far as you know, being comfortable, but everyone's different as far as what they want, but, you know, think about that, you know. So Michael, that, that 78 degree mark in the summertime, yeah. that's if you are using uh, central air conditioning for your house. Right. Is, is that, yeah. So one of the reasons that that temperature can be so high is because central air conditioning dehumidifies your house. It takes the moisture out mm -hmm. and your body will feel a lot more comfortable at 78 degrees in dry air as opposed to 78 degrees in moist, muggy air. So yeah. 78 may sound hot, but if your moist, if the moisture is removed, it's really comfortable. Um, and then some low cost ways: clock your windows. You know, seal the air licks, and that that's all about the air. You know, uh, trying to to keep the air air sealing the house. So low flush, low flow shower heads and faucets are a good thing. They're very inexpensive to do, and you get a approximately the same pressure, but you're using less water to go through those shower heads and faucets. Um, and make sure you have your heating systems and, and air conditioning systems service yearly, um, at least, because, you know, the, there is a, you know, cost to have someone come out, but it could make your system last longer and um, also to, um, you know, and, and perform more efficiently and they can troubleshoot anything that might be going on. Um, insulate your hot water heater. So many people have it in the basement. It's a cool, unconditioned basement. And you do so much heat with that water heater that uh, they sell jackets for water heaters. It's called like at Home Depot or something. And it's good to, to insulate that water heater and, and keep the hot water hotter for longer periods of time uh, instead of like radiating it out from the um, hot water tank. And also duct, make sure your duct or pipe in, is insulated. Uh, the, what, especially the, the ducts that are, going, are piping, like if you have a radiator system and it's running through your basement, there's usually a lot of exposed radiator piping down there and it's losing heat before it gets to your radiator and gets to the conditioned space. So um, make sure that gets insulated and your ducts in the same way and um, uh, keep all your ducts in a row. Um, LEDs, uh, LEDs are so much more efficient than uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs. I remember when those came out about 10, uh, or maybe like 15 years ago, everyone was doing CFLs. And also environmentally, they're better because you don't have the mercury that is in uh, the CFLs. Um, 
Uh, so the LEDs are at least four times and, and four times longer lasting too. So even if they cost a few, few cents more, they'll save you money in the long run and be more energy efficient. And, um, and, and shades or drapes are, are a great way in the winter time to close them, to give you that little bit of extra layer of insulation at your windows. Because even if you have good windows, they might, the wall has much more insulated value than your window. So um, it's nice to be able to, um, to be able to up that. And plant a tree in your yard. Um, you know, plant trees. You know, that there takes a while for that to happen. It might be for your children or something, but it's a, it's a good thing for the environment. You put some um, conifers, something like white pines or something on the, the, uh, the windy side of your house. And, you know, in a while they'll grow up and they'll be act as a block or you put the uh, um, deciduous trees on your Southern side. So when they get larger, the, they'll shade you in the winter time or in the summertime, I'm sorry, and with the leaves. And when they drop their leaves, they, they allow the, the light in and the um, solar gain. And they're sequestering carbon dioxide and bringing that down into the earth, which is another great benefit of planting trees. Absolutely. Um, and then, um, this is pretty much uh, the same, so just get through there. And let's talk about at home energy audit now. You may have heard of those before and people are afraid of audits, uh, but this is a good audit, not, not the kind that the IRS <laughs> gives to uh, give you. I, I like assessor better, but um, it seems like the, the term audit is energy auditor. Um, it's a, you have someone that's a professional that has a certain tools and stuff and Stephen likes, likens it to a doctor who has, a, you know, analytic tool, analytical tools um, to use for your house to assess and then give recommendations of way to improve, you know, they, they do the shell of the house and all the operating systems within the house. Um, no, that can, what to expect, uh, recommendations for energy saving measures that can be taken. Um, and they give you an approximate, you know, based upon your, the electric rate or your, or your oil rate that you're using, they'll give you approximate payback time. So they might say, this, this measure will cost you, you know, $3,000 to do, but in, eight years, you'll have paid that back. Then after that eight year from the savings, then after that year, eight years, it's just saving, pure savings for you. So it's a payback period um, for that. Uh, show how to correct money, pinpoint where your house is losing energy, um, the efficiency of the heating. They, they analyze the heating equipment, your ducts or your or your um, furnace or your boiler um, and, and check the efficiency if it's operating up to the efficiency that it's supposed to be um, and shows ways to conserve hot water and electricity. And, and they also check certain health and safety factors of your home. They come in with the, I think I have one that, um, well, with the tools and it's, it's called a gas sniffer and they come in with that and make sure there's no really low, like if you have gas um, uh, uh, ranges and things like that, you, you, you cook with gas and stuff. Sometimes there's a very small leaks there that is bringing one of those air source, uh, those pollutants into your house. So they will check to see if there is any, um, any leakage inside or and outside at the, if you have a tank you're, you're heating with gas or you're um, you know cooking with gas they they have it and they'll check it on the outside too so you're not losing it and putting the you know, un unburned gas into the air so uh, the health and safety aspects are key and kind of a theme that you might have heard running through a lot of this we want our homes to be healthy we want them to be safe and we want them to be energy efficient. And 
the, the health and safety run so closely together. If you're utilizing any kind of fossil fuel burning device, whether it be your water heater, a gas boiler, an oil boiler, and even your cook stove, you can be introducing carbon monoxide into your home if the unit is not burning efficiently. So one of the things that the energy auditor will do is use a device called a manometer. Not, I'm sorry, not a manometer. Uh, that's, that's for air pressure. Uh, but they will use a, a carbon monoxide detector and, and go room to room and, and see if there's uh, carbon monoxide existing in your room or in, in your house due to your combustion appliances. Mm -hmm. And how to find an energy auditor? Well, in New York State, um, if you're there, Sean Welsh at the Cornell Cooperative Extension, they, they um, would, he would be able to help you with that and many aspects of, of uh, energy savings um, type uh, measures. And then I would recommend uh, contacting SEEDS um, uh, in Pennsylvania, and they'll be able to assist you in locating an energy auditor there um, for your home. One of those, you know, those would be probably the first two places to start with to, to find an auditor. Um, an auditor is like a doctor and uses, uh, you know, various techniques and equipment, a blower door test, which probably many of you have heard of a blower door test. And I, I have a slide or two on that. And it measures the extent of the leaks in the building envelope. And they use infrared cameras to see where you might be hard detect, um, uh, you know, for uh, for hard detect uh, areas of air infiltration and missing insulation and gas sniffers, which is what Steve was just talking about. Um, and then they first assess, uh, you know, how much the home uh, consumes and its health and and. Uh, what measures can be taken to make it more energy efficient and cost effective. A blower door measures the extent of leaks in the building. It, it, it depressurizes the building. You can go either way, but typically it depressurizes the building. And um, so they use a, uh, a, a, a blower door, an infrared camera, and uh, that's a, that's a duplicate, sorry about that. Um, they go into great detail going room by room. It's usually at least a two hour um, thing and, and you need to do some preparation beforehand. The auditor comes or make a list, make a list of anything that you notice and any problems, any uncomfortable or drafty rooms or condensation you notice at certain times and, um, uh, and prior, prioritize your desired outcome relative to a retrofit, you know, what you're trying to achieve with that. And then you need the copies of your home uh, energy bills, such as your electric utility bill or your, your gas bill or your um, oil bill, you know, for your equipment because they use this in their diagnostics. Um, this is a blower door. They, the red is, they, it basically has three components. It has a, um, the, the fan, which is at the bottom, which, is, which would be sucking out the air. It's got the panel system. You put this on any exterior door and um, it's got a panel system that, that clamps into that door opening uh, tightly. And it's got a manometer, which is a pressure sensor that Stephen had mentioned. And that, um, that's hooked to the fan and, and measures the amount of pressure. So, um, and that, so it's put into the door and the house is put into winter condition. You close all the windows uh, and exterior doors and you make sure that your flue, if you have a fireplace or wood stove is closed, you make sure uh, no fans are on and um, and you put into what they call winter condition. So, um, but you also wanna 
make sure one of the a very, very important thing before this is make sure you don't have any asbestos piping or any known, um, you know, you don't have a high radon uh, in your house or any other pollutants in the house that this could just exasperate because if you turn that fan on and you have some pipes downstairs that have asbestos insulation, you know, he, he must check to see that you don't have that. Otherwise, you're disturbing that and creating the carcinogenic um, effects of that uh, and bringing that into your house because it's sucking your air out. They call it 50 um, to, to a point of pascals is the amount of pressure, 50 um, pascals. Uh, what is it, Stephen? Uh, 50 pascals, it's, it's the equivalent yeah. of putting a uh, yeah. 25 mile per hour wind on all six sides of your house. So you have yeah. massive amounts of air blowing in. So they slightly depressurize it and they walk through the house with either, either a smoke stick um, or some, some other device. And you can, you can actually just see where the, the, the air is coming in around your windows, around outlets. Outlets are an important thing to seal. They make outlet covers. I didn't mention it earlier, but outlets are, are a very, um, you know, uh, can, uh, way of um, trying to put a gasket around it because you can lose a lot of heat through your just regular electric outlets and things like that. So they can detect where the leaks are in your house. Where, um, and so you know where to concentrate on sealing that house. Um, air leaks in the direction you don't want. Air leaks carry hot human air. I'm going real quickly because uh, we're running out of time. Uh, yeah, you want you want to they carry hot humid outdoor air into your house in the summer and um, they um, or bathroom fans into the attic. Um, they, they the air leaks in the summer, by the way, that carry that hot humid outdoor air into your house. That's a primary concern if you have your interior conditioned to be cold. Because one of the principles of thermodynamics is that warm, moist air always moves to the cold area, which is, and that works both in summer and winter when it's warm outside and hot and humid and you your house is uh, 68 degrees because you want it really nicely cooled, you're gonna be, the, the vapor drive is gonna be pulling that warm, moist outside air in through your walls and into your house. And in the wintertime when your house is nice and cozy warm um, and it's cold outside, the vapor drives are going to be pushing that warm air out through your walls and windows to the outside. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah. where both air sealing and really good insulation go hand in hand to make sure that you have a, a nice, comfortable, safe, healthy home. So this is what Stephen was just talking about, that this um, the first law of building signs, but it's the second law of thermodynamics is stuff moves from more to less. Air moves from, uh, from more air to less air. Moisture moves from more moisture to less moisture. Heat moves from more heat to less heat and high pressure moves uh, to low pressure. And when we're talking about air moves from more air to less air, that's really the density of the air and it's a measure of how much moisture is in the air. So again, warm, moist air is going to seek out cold, dry air, whether it's moving that cold or that warm, moist air in the wintertime outside of your house or in the summertime, it's gonna be driving that warm moist air into your air conditioned house. So that's what we right. mean by air being more or less is the density. Um, even small air flows care a lot. Uh, we, this is very similar to what Stephen was just mentioning. Um, it's amazing on how like a 
a one inch hole in a four by eight sheet of gypsum uh, will move about 30 quarts of water seasonally um, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, say your house is, and outside 40 degrees. So that, that's um, quite a bit. That's like about the six, uh, seven gallons of water will move through just a one inch, one inch square inch hole. And the reason that that's important is because in our typical homes today, that water, it, it's not bulk water, like pouring a quart of water in, it's, it's uh, diffusion, it's water vapor. That water vapor gets trapped inside the wall cavity. And if our vapor barriers are improperly designed, that moisture cannot move out of the wall cavity. So it stays in the wall cavity, it wets our insulation, it makes our insulation unhealthy, ineffective, and it becomes a perfect medium for mold to grow. Mm -hmm. so, the, and, so that's why yeah. air seed, this all has to do with air sealing, you know, trying to make sure your exterior is sealed very well. Well, it, it, it's also more than just air sealing. It's also about vapor barriers on our houses for, you know, and we're learning this. We, we've learned this, we've, we've gained so much knowledge about it. Once upon a time, we thought that, you know, having, um, because we thought, okay, we, we can stop the moisture from going from the inside of our house to the, through the wall to the outside by putting up plastic once we put our insulation up and that plastic would be a vapor barrier, but that vapor barrier doesn't breathe. Moisture in a wall has to be able to move to whichever plane is drier, to the outside or to the inside, if we want to have a safe, healthy home. And, and that, that creates a durable home that's not going to rot away. So we're learning more and more. Building codes are changing. They're redefining vapor barriers, air barriers, where we need to place them and how they're placed. Um, and, and that's where a really good understanding of the principles of building science come into play. And, and building science can really in, inform us how to properly retrofit our homes so that they're safe, healthy, and resilient, and how we can build new homes so that they are safe, healthy, and resistant as well. Absolutely. There's, uh, this just kind of talks about where to air seal, you know, uh, behind bathtubs is a notorious and shower stall units. Um, it's really important and um, Un unconditioned attic spaces. You're through the ceiling. There's oftentimes many places where you need to um, seal uh, because you have the light fixtures and things like that, and just um, general cavities that need to be uh, covered. You've got chases for the uh, ducts and electric and plumbing. You, you know, oftentimes people just, you know, put those in and, and the contractor doesn't seal those and make sure they're closed off from the heated space to the unheated space. So those chaseways are important to be um, addressed. Um, and the caps around electric outlets and sw uh, switch boxes and things, um, important to seal those off. Uh, uh, this pretty much uh, is, is the same thing we've been talking about. I'm trying to go through. And then this kind of shows that, you know, you, the winter air um, enters in low into the house. And then it, it, it is the warm air that's in the house escapes through the ceiling and the upper floors. Um, so that's uh, just, just the way it comes in. Um, and so, and that's your neutral pressure. This is really, but um, this is what we're talking about, your thermal boundary, your thermal boundary is where your insulation is and everything um, should align with your pressure boundary and your, your, your moisture uh, boundary. Those should, those should follow the same path. But this, if you have an existing house, is already fairly established, but you have to determine whether your basement is part of that 
thermal and um, if you don't have any insulation in your floor, if you have an unheated basement and no floor insulation, which I see often, you are, you know, you are bringing in that cold, moist air up into your house and it's so important to seal it. And um, uh, uh, let me just go through, get all these on there. Um, make sure adequate ventilation, seal the top and the bottom first and, and uh, seal doors and windows. Uh, going through a lot of stuff here. And I, I know this is hard to wrap your brain around. So even I'm getting a little, um, but, uh, but it's, it's all, all about sealing your, your house. So we do, we talked about all the benefits of it, of it, that, um, maintains a healthy environment, dramatic, dramatically increases comfort and reduces a uh, heating system. We've talked about all those already. And uh, air sealing is a very good, uh, air sealing your exterior, your shell is a very good bang for your buck, as they say, investment wise, because it doesn't take a whole lot and costs a whole lot. And, um, and in order to create that. Uh, sealing the rest of the house. This is a wet, talked about wet stripping and just more things about ceilings. Like I said, you'll get this uh, PowerPoint if you want to uh, go back and re review it. Um, a lot of air sealing techniques can be done by the homeowner if you're handy with with things and and aren't um, um, or if you feel comfortable being on a ladder, but. First and foremost, it, it always requires attention to detail. And that's where most of our builders miss these air sealing opportunities when they're building a house. They are in such a hurry to build a house, they are not paying attention to the detail of proper air sealing. And then they leave that to the homeowner to suffer the heat loss and you know the economic uh, um, drawbacks of having your heated air escape. Weather stripping is such an important aspect too of your doors and stuff. You must, you know, what, you know, look at every door and just see if you see daylight through it or you feel drafts through it and you can weather strip. You, it's a very inexpensive way to save a lot of energy and money by buying some weather stripping and, and putting it on your doors and your sweeps uh, for the door and stuff like that. Um, this is one thing that Steve was talking about as far as this uses a lot of high embodied energy. This is from like about, you know, 10 years ago until we learn more about the neg negative effects. That's uh, the, the great stuff or uh, that's called, you know, you're getting cans and it's important to insulate. This is in the basement and the rim joist. The rim joist is the board that goes you know, that, that your floor joists die into at the exterior wall. And many, many times, I see this so often in houses that they don't bother to do this. This would be in the basement typically. And there is so much heat lost out through that way because you just have a single piece of wood stopping it. So this was a retrofit as far as putting in some rigid insulation and then sealing the gaps, the, the, the seams of that rigid insulation. Um, and this is another way that it was done with, with a, a spray a spray foam, but they're making other, uh, you were talking- Spray foam's a no-no now. Yeah, let's keep the spray foam out. Too, too, yeah, many, we, too, we, too, too much off-gassing and too many greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. This is an old slide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. But they still do that today quite a bit. In fact, John Tractor will recommend because it's an easy way for them, but it's a very costly way too. Um, Spray know. foam has the highest price per R value, which uh, if you look at, look at insulations that way, um, it's a no brainer, don't use it. It's also a toxic um, off gas insulation to to install if you look at if you look at an installer of spray foam the um, um, 
the personal protective equipment that they're wearing. There's a, a, a mask, which often will be connected to a supplied breathing uh, supply. They're covered in a Tyvek suit. Um, it's nasty stuff. Whereas on the other hand, cellulose is such a great um, opportunity to, to, to insulate. It, it has um, so many good qualities. Um, it, and cellulose is made from um, recycled newsprint. And as um, newsprint comes in short supply because of newspapers, uh, some going, you know, not being as readily available, there are now manufacturers who are procuring recycled cardboard um, mm -hmm. for, uh, for, to make the cellulose insulation. And mm -hmm. what, what um, you know, this wood fiber, paper comes from wood, this wood fiber is treated with a borate, which not only makes it unsavory to insects, so insects won't harbor in there, it also helps as a fire and flame retardant. Um, so cellulose can be applied um, typically in your exterior walls and there are special tools to apply it. And when it's applied, it is done in what's called dense pack. Um, it's, it's done, it's, you use a two-stage blowing machine that has high air pressure so that you're putting the proper volume of cellulose into the cavity and it's being densely packed in. I don't know how many of you have ever made your own sauerkraut, but you know, when you pack that sauerkraut into the jar for canning, you densely pack it into the jar so that you can turn the jar upside down and it's not going to come out. The air pressure, proper air pressure with installing cellulose has that same effect. It is densely packed into the wall cavity so it does not settle. Okay. Um, it's also, um, it can also be put into your attics, your attic space as, um, you know, a, a really good- Blowing in. Room. That way it's yeah. loosely blowing in and you can just blow in a lot of it into your attic and, and really, but you must air seal first. That's, a, that's yes. the thing. Before you, you do anything, you air seal, then if you need uh, additional, it can also be blown into existing homes um, from the exterior. You can take off a board. I think I have a slide here. And, and even if you have a little bit of insulation in it, the, the fiberglass, um, it will push that fiberglass um, and compress it and, and go into the house and give it a, a much better one. And then they can take off one of the, the boards, you know, older homes often have clapboard. They can take off one of the clapboard, drill holes in it and blow this, you know, and all the walls and blow this in and then put the, the piece back. So it can be uh, blown in on existing houses too, not just new ones. Um, uh, this talks about that. Ventilation, yeah. Now we talked about ventilation. Let's uh, about air sealing. Now we have to make sure we get enough ventilation. Um, and HRV is a heat ex um, heat recovery ventilation, and it 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 basically takes out outgoing air from your house, which is warmed or cooled in either one. But let's say it's winter, it's warm air, and it without interacting with it, it, it crosses, it has, um, without, it, it blows it out, but the air it's taking in from the exterior passes over the, passes over it, and so it exchanges the outgoing heat. It takes heat from the air, the heated air, and brings in the cool air and, and, and puts some of that, most of that heat into the cool air. So it's zero outside, it's 68 inside. You might, you don't wanna be bringing in zero degree air to your house, but it will exchange the heat and um, maybe warm it up to 40 or 50 degrees to, to bring it in. So that's what it, and, and H, it, it, this is what uh, it looks like 
it's just a box. It's a very simple technology. A magic it's, box. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's, it's magical. It, it just, it just it transfers the heat of the outgoing air to the heat to the in the cool in uh, going air. It's just small box and it has some ductwork, flexible tube ductwork going uh, into places, um, into rooms and stuff. Michael, could I just flip back to that discussion of the insulations for, for a moment? Um, um, I don't know where. Well, then you don't have to change the slides. You could stay right where you were. Um, so a, a question in the chat box was, um, you know, the foam insulations uh, were advertised as uh, soy-based or natural plant-based insulations. And um, that's really misleading advertising on the part of the spray foam manufacturers. According to the federal law, federal guidelines, you can have as little as 7% of a product be plant-based and call it a plant-based product. The other 93% in the case of spray foam is still toxic chemicals, petroleum, plastic. Um, so that was just a, a sales gimmick that, that they put into um, uh, you know, to try to capture the, the green um, advertising market. One of the other uh, sales pitches that is used often is, well, well, um, we use recycled plastic bottles in our in our spray foam, so it um, uh, you know it, it's a way that we're reducing um, product use because we're recycling. And you know, I, I asked the, the representative of this company at a trade show that I was at. So I said you know, when you recycle plastic bottles, the process is to chip it into pellets and then you can liquefy that pellet to put it into a product. What are you using to keep that pellet liquefied in your spray foam? And he of course would not answer because the chemical that is used to keep that plastic liquid is highly toxic. So mm -hmm. that's just to stay away from foam. Yeah, they, exactly. It has it's a very high embodied energy. Um, plus it's toxic. <laughs> plus it's toxic, exactly. Steel has high embodied energy, but it's not toxic. But spray foam is both toxic and has a high embodied energy. <laughs> and also, when they give the R values to it, it's under perfect conditions installed under perfect. Oftentimes when they're installing it into a house, it's not perfect conditions and it's not being mixed perfectly and everything. So you get much less R value, uh, which, is, which is how they are rated, which we didn't even get to. And I see we're um, uh, really running out of time right now. So. Skip that rigid foam board. That's a no, no, we've got better stuff now. <laughs> yep, yep. Or, yeah, can off be done without hurting the interior cellulose is a great material. Um, uh, it's possible to blow some walls with cellulose, uh, even if you have some bad insulation into your it's, um, fire blocking. Uh, we're, you know, it's, none of these are really, um, yeah, drilled. I talked about how they drill make sure drilled holes are well sealed after they put it in uh, the band joys this this is a retrofit where they where they where they put rigid insulation and then onto the house existing house and then resided it um afterwards and that's what we were talk talking about that that stopping the thermal bridging because it's it's on the outside of the house um instead of uh yeah. but instead. this this is a this is a an example too of how that project was not done properly it was not properly air sealed i don't know if you can pinch yeah. your picture michael and blow up this, if you can blow up this uh picture where oh. the part of it where it has the um the foam um 
No. If you look, well, none of those, none of the seams of this insulation were taped or sealed. You can see so that. So you still have your air leaks. So it makes it much less effective and efficient. So it's, and that's an important uh, thing to remember. And this is why I was talking about how they can blow cellulose insulation in an existing house by taking off one of the boards and drilling holes at each cavity. It's a tedious, um, you know, laborsome thing, but it's, uh, it helps the efficiency of the house greatly. Um, and, uh, and then they put that board back on afterwards after they seal the holes. They put the plugs back in and they seal those holes. This is bad insulation. Fiberglass insulation is another insulation that I guess had its time, but I don't recommend it now. What you're seeing there is one of the things that fiberglass is so famous for. It's a great habitat for rodents. Mice love to get into it. Squirrels love to get into it. Uh, you can see the deficiencies in it, uh, the gap between the roof stud and the fiberglass bat. That's a major area where you have continued heat loss and air infiltration. It's not and consistent either. Yeah, as far yeah. as the way, here's, here's another one, that new application we saw at our house and this is doing absolutely nothing. I mean, basically say, so yeah, we insulated, this is a, a rim joist and unless it's completely sealed, but also, it promotes the convection loop that we were talking about. You put this in the wall, fiberglass in the wall, and air movement can move around in it and lose heat, um, which is you know, negating the um, R value, so the resistive value. So that's, fiberglass is not one we recommend. And also you can see this was up in an attic space and, um, once again, you see the, the rodents and also the dirt where you have air leakage, um, you tend to, it tends to, this is a good sign that there's air leakage there because it's collecting dirt um, in the insulation itself. And then windows and doors. Okay, let's just real quick, our value measures the thermal resistance of a material. The higher the R value per inch, the greater the thermal resistance. So um, typically use, this is used for like insulation. U value is another way to measure, but this measures the conductivity of the material. And all that means is that the, the rate of, of heat transfer through a material. So uh, R value is how resistive oh, the material is to heat transfer, U value, and it's typically used for windows in our country, is how quickly that energy can transfer through a pane of glass. So the smaller, the lower the number of U value, the more energy efficient it is, where in our value, the higher the number. So you'll, you'll see on windows, they'll give you the U value it's just the inverse. I think the next one, yeah. R value is just the inverse of the U value. You just divide it by one. Um, you, you divide to get the R value um, or get the, they're, they're, you just divide it by, it's just the inverse of it, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so a window that has a U value of 0.19 it converts an R value of 5.26, which is pretty good for a pane of glass. Yeah. Um, and a window with the U value of 0 0.30 has an R value of 3.3, .3, which is pretty poor. And so, so talking about windows real quickly, um, there's a lot of emphasis on buying Energy Star rated windows, but you have to be really, and I'm talking fast because I realize we're running out of time. And this part is so important. You have to be really um, cautious about buying a typical um, Energy Star window because a lot of them are Energy Star rated for a cooling atmosphere, the South. We are in a, heat, a heating dominated climate. So when you look at new windows 
uh, you have to really look at um, how solar heat gain is either enhanced or reduced, how uh, the emissive coatings, which are coatings that can block that heat transfer through the window, where are they in the window? Is it on the inside of the window or the outside of the window? If you're in a, a, um, a heating dominated climate like we are, you want that emissivity coating to be on the inside so that it, it reflects back the heat that wants to go out of the, your window in, you know, in, in the winter time. Um, so that's another, that's a whole study in and of itself. And uh, yeah, the moral of the story is don't rely on the, on the window salesperson saying, well, this is an energy star rated window. Of course it's gonna work. Yeah, it, it, you can tune a window, properly built windows, you can tune a window to have a different glazing set for the north side and the south side and the east side and the west side because you know each side hand brings in heat differently than uh, because the other. of the sun. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we're I don't know, Tannis. It looks like we're running over. Hi. Um, well, what? How much more time do you need to um, complete your your program? I don't know. Uh, probably about fifteen minutes or so. Uh, okay. I don't know. Does everyone? Does you know, anyone have any burning questions at this point that we might want to just, you know, come off a chat uh, or you know, unmute and just. Is there anything, any kind of burning question that, that we want to have an in, a more in-depth discussion about in terms of how to properly retrofit or weatherize your home? Well, people, folks, you can unmute and ask your questions and also like um, let us know what, how your time is. There's like a, there's three or four of us here. So we can, you can unmute right now and like share your time frame for for continuation and or ask questions as Stephen suggested. Mm -hmm. well, just... We were going to get in from, from windows since no one is, uh, yeah, replacing windows is a very expensive way of um, by one of the most of, of uh, you know, reducing your heat loss in e existing or heat gain in existing homes. So um, it, it's effective, but um, it's, a, it's a pricey way. So it's probably more critical or more um, financially feasible to do all the other aspects of uh, the the replacing because then we get into insulation now and there's fiberglass which we already said we do not recommend uh, both Stephen and I um, it is maybe a little less costly but you've heard of the new product of maybe Roxol is a brand name R-O-X-U-L -R and that's a rock wool and that's a recycled material that um, gives a very good sealing. Um, air sealing is not conducive to animals and um, it, uh, it compresses into the wall. Um, Roxel is also a very good um, fire barrier. It's um, it, it will not react to flame until it reaches over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, it is used in um, UL listed enclosures to uh, reduce the space between a chimney flue and combustible materials. That being said, don't just go ahead and do that. Always make sure that what you're doing with any of this stuff meets the proper building codes uh, because you could really, you could, you could think you're doing well because you heard Stephen and Michael tell you about it. But if you don't do it well, if you don't do the research, if you don't do your due diligence, 
um, you could be creating a, a worse situation for yourself. So these are insulation types. And uh, so we talked about rock. So spray foam, we've talked enough about that. This is an old slide. I just want to, I mean, many, many people, but that's for, as Stephen noted, that for the R value you're getting, it's the most expensive and it's also the most hazardous material. Um, and then you have blown in insulation, the cellulose. Uh, you can do it loose in the attic if you don't have attic or you don't have much attic um, insulation. It's an easy way to do it. Um, and then you have the, you know, they, they have blown in fiberglass too, um, which is better than the fiberglass you see, the pink stuff you put in the wall. And then rigid, there's much more this slide needed to be updated because anything that you see that's called polyisocyanurate, you know, it has uh, some chemicals in it that isn't good for you. Um, you know, that's a rigid and Stephen rocks of rock wool rigid insulation is out there too and it's become economically uh, feasible. So if, if you wanna put uh, rigid insulation in places in the house, a rock wool would be a good rigid insulation to put in there. Yes, um, if, if we had that rigid rock rock sole board, when I did that sill plate, uh, yeah. that foam board, I would have used the rock sole instead of the foam, but that product wasn't available in this country at that time. We talked about our value um, uh, already about uh, the R value. So that's, uh, um, we talked about that too. This gives kind of relative um, R values to different types of insulation. And, um, and, and so that's just, uh, you know, of what we've already mentioned. It, this is a continuation of that list of, um, of R values. And, and this, should, this got put in the wrong place. It talks about energy use and stuff. Um, and in a typical home of, and of where you should concentrate on. Now this, um, you know, and, and this is considered, we already talked about that too. Uh, we talked about a lot of these. I'm gonna send up for these next few slides, you're gonna have backup information that talks about what you know what this talks about the item but what it expands upon how you can you can save energy with each of these and this is what's the amazing thing this is what we have in our house i mean we it, you don't think about it but um the home occupant behavior you got washing machine dryer dehumidifier dishwasher freezer refrigerators microwaves lighting, all these different light switches, computers, office equipment, and uh, you, you've got telephones, entertainment centers, battery chargers, uh, you know, just uh, water fixtures, water heaters, telephones, power management tools, televisions, all these items um, are, are in a house and it, each one could be looked at and a, a little bit of savings in each one can add up to quite a bit of savings and energy and, and uh, financially also. Um, ceiling fans, fireplaces. It's just amazing when I came across this. And like I said, each one of these has a little bit of, um, with the backup material that we send you next week, we'll explain how the you know what you could do as far as cost savings for each of these it, it just blows you away and then the last one was the renewable energy and um you know it it seems like you know there there are places to go seeds would be unfortunately in pennsylvania there's not much incentive for it but you still get the federal incentives that's dropping every year for installing a, a solar uh, uh, hot water or a photovoltaic, you know, solar electric. It's important to keep in mind, though, that that federal incentive is a federal tax 
credit. credit. It's not a federal tax refund. Right. So in order to take advantage of the federal tax credit, you have to have a pretty healthy tax appetite. So if, you, if you're gonna be paying a lot in federal income taxes this year or next year, it would be a good time to get a, a PV system on your house because you can really take advantage then of the federal tax credit. 26% right now and every year it's going down. Um, but you, and you have three years to use it also. So you don't have to say, well, I've got to use that whole, say you have a $20,000 system and you get, you know, 26, which is about 25%, $5,000. If you don't have a, a $5,000 tax bill, then you, um, you can put, apply some of it this year and some of it to next year's taxes and some of your to the, the following taxes. In New York State, you also get a state tax credit, which is 20%. So you get the federal tax credit plus the state tax credit. Well, not really, because one supersedes the other in New York State. What so once, well, I, once the federal is no once the federal is taken off your state's reduced or vice versa, so you oh, don't, you, don't do, but you, you still can tap into it. You can still tap into yeah. it, but it's not but for it's the not whole the amount. cost of the whole system, right? And now, the other thing to watch about that too is in financing, um, a lot of solar developers will say, well, you know, with the this is what the system costs. You get the federal tax credit. Um, so this is what, you know, we can give you a loan for this amount. And when you get your federal tax credit, you know, you, that'll be a bridge loan and they expect, so the, it's, it's, it can be really faulty information if you can't take advantage of the federal tax credit, you will end up mm -hmm. spending more mm -hmm. on interest on a loan for that system. So just, just be cautious, do your homework, do your math, have, uh, have someone else put their eyes on it, you know, and, and see if it makes sense to them. The approach I took just in ending of, of oh, and what I'm going to talk about is like in my house, I have an 1860s farmhouse that I totally got rehabbed and renovated. And I wanted to get rid of all fossil fuels in the house. So I went all electric. I love gas stoves, but I, I bit the bullet and went with an electric one. And with electric convection and conduction, they, they become very efficient. But electric water here, electric dryer, the mini splits, the air source heat pumps are electric. And I put in a solar system. And now I, I make more energy with my solar system every year than I do to operate my home. And I have no fossil fuels whatsoever coming to the home. So that's, you know, that would be if you're building a new home or you're doing a total rehab of your home to go with an all electric home and use a, a, a PV system. And there's a couple ways to do it. I think I. Um, well, Michael, you also don't need to have your own PV system in order to right, take advantage exactly. of renewable energy. You can source. Um, in New York State, you can source your electricity use from a 100% renewable energy supplier. Um, your, your, your utility, which ours is NYSEG, does not produce the electricity that they sell. Yes. Uh, I don't know how that works in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, really they have something similar. They have, um, which I didn't, clean, clean energy, co well, the clean energy co-op, or picking from a PAP, you know, PAPowerSwitch.com. And you can do the same thing in Pennsylvania. Um, switch to a, in New York, they call it ESCO, an energy supply company that uses, a, that supplies, because your electricity is, comes to you in two, as two parts. It has a distribution, which is like if you have PPML or something, or if you have NYSEG, you know, they're the, they own the power lines, they own the distribution system. But then where, they, the, where that energy comes from, the electricity comes from, is from varied sources. And you can choose a source that uses all electric energy or all uh, renewable energy, such as wind and solar. And so, 
So, so the you, bottom line is if you, if you really want to buy your energy or have your energy to be um, emissions free, you can do that without having it. If you can't afford a solar system, like I still can't afford a solar system, I can buy, my, I do buy my energy from a company that uh, does produce the electricity from 100% renewable resources. Mm -hmm. So well, you can have, you can have, you can have both. In Pennsylvania, you can do the same thing, according to Jack. Uh, Barnett, who I asked about that because I'm not familiar. So, so yeah, if you do nothing at all, switch to a company that uses all um, renewable sources for producing their electric. Um, is a, is a great step, and and in New York, you can they have community shared solar. You can buy into a a company that a local company and. Um, that uh, is producing electric and be, take part in their, their company, um, buy shares or you know, buy so much um, energy from them on a yearly basis. That's another way to, um, to, to help out the planet. So that's all we got for now. Wonderful. Thank you very much to Stephen and to Michael for this, this wonderfully informative presentation. I, I got lots of notes myself. Okay. It's great. Wow. <laughs> um, so thank you. And I want to thank everybody who attended today. Uh, tomorrow at the farm at Willow Wisp and where we have the Farm Arts Collective greenhouse and um, space where we do a lot of our activities and workshops. Um, we'll be having our far, um, benefit, harvest benefit from two o'clock to five o'clock tomorrow. So you're free to come, wear a mask, of course, and join in on the fun and help support the company. Uh, so thank you to both of you. You did a lot of work preparing for this, and I hope you'll be able to use this again in other situations. This, this PowerPoint's fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for, for, for participating. Yeah, there were some good questions that were uh, entered into the chat box. And um, if there's anything else that you still think is unanswered, um, shoot uh, Tanis a note, an email, or a text message. Uh, don't shoot her. Just send a text <laughs> message or or an email um, and then we will get that answered for you but one yeah. more time you'll get the you, you'll get you'll be sending this just from farm rights collective we'll be sending this to you uh the powerpoint along with the presentation that we just went through and uh, some backup information if you want to pursue it a little further Great. And are we able to share your contact information with the participants today? Absolutely. Okay. Please. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. If they have questions, they can contact uh, one of us directly, at least. And I will put together a, um, a reading list of uh, some really informative books that I've been using that give um, really great insight into these topics. Fantastic. That's great. We'll even post it on our website. That would be great. Okay. Cool. All right, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. And I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank Bye you so now. much for this informative presentation. Right. Thank you for joining us and happy birthday. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> this is our birthday gift to you, Anna. <laughs> and it was a great one, I might say. Excellent. I learned a lot. Excellent. So thank you again. Okay. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye. Take Bye, care. Bye. 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 Bye.